for the seventh million time since COVID, I've heard that woman's voice uh, letting us know <laughs> that we are now recording this webinar. It's super, I'm very grateful to see all of you, Ron and Cheryl and uh, everyone, thank you so much. I'm going to put this little focus on over here so I don't start to get blown up with text messages so I won't be distracted. We are going to discuss uh, some of the same topics we did yesterday. However, because it's live, there'll be new information that we'll share. So those of you that have returned, thank you. For those that are here, uh, we hope to provide a lot of value. This is recorded. We'll send the recording next week if you've missed it. Uh, I want to reiterate to all of you the value of spending time at prisonprofessors.com. My business partner, our partner, Michael Santos, who has been on the road for weeks speaking to uh, prisons across the country, uh, doing the advocacy work inside the prisons and jails. He, regardless of how much Michael travels and the commitments that he has, he still takes the time almost every day to produce very compelling content that's free. It's yeah. simply an investment of your time to review it. So many of you by now know that I'm Justin. I run White Collar Advice. White Collar Advice is a proud sponsor of Prison Professors, where we give all of this work away. And in a moment, I'm going to transition over to Sam, who's going to talk about an update in the First Step Act um, policy and the law that came down yesterday. But I just just want to always stress the free resources we give away at prison professors, including spending time watching interviews we've done with subject matter experts, because everything that we are sharing comes by way of what we've learned from a federal judge or a case manager or someone like that, as I now transition to muting everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. So I really want to stress the value of going through our free content. And like everything else, some do it, some don't. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult going to prison, the stress, everything that accompanies it. But you'll be further along if you commit to doing 30 minutes a day. I want you to think what Michael taught me in prison, slow and steady wins the race, tortoise in the hair. Just do a few minutes every day. Then you won't feel like you were cramming the day before you go to prison or something like that. Um, that said, I'm going to touch for a couple of minutes today on the very lengthy sentencing yesterday by Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, a few things the judge said, uh, what someone like her could do next, because it applies to all of us. If you have interest in watching, I filmed a live stream as soon as the sentence came down on YouTube yesterday, covering a number of things like jobs in prison, restitution, things that we discussed, but you might find some of it um, interesting. If you do, you'll find it on the White Collar Advice YouTube channel. I filmed it yesterday. With that said, Sam... Um, take the stage as I go to a screen share with the blog that uh, Michael Santos wrote yesterday, talking about some changes to the First Step Act. Okay, so it's not so much changes. Yeah. What we're finally seeing is that uh, the law that was passed in 2018 and finally implemented, at least as far as your earned time credits go, in January this year, um, is being properly recognized and hopefully uh, um, managed and rolled out throughout the Bureau of Prisons. It was very disconcerting a few months, or maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, when we started getting calls from clients and, and, and families saying that their loved ones were you know, incarcerated for a year and they went to their case managers to find out why they hadn't gotten their earned time credits. And their case manager said, well, you didn't fill out the, the survey when you came in and you needed to fill out the survey. Therefore, the whole past year, sorry, you don't get credit. Or clients that had shorter sentences, you know, maybe 30 months or less. And by the time they got in and were there for a few months, they were already at the point of having a release date within 18 months of uh, their meeting with the case manager. And the case manager said, no, Bureau of Prison says that we have we are we stop giving you earned time credit, credit towards a sentence reduction once you get within 18 months of your sentence. None of that was part of the law. It's just, you have to understand, the Bureau of Prisons is a massive machine, and they follow their own set of rules when they can to be convenient for them. And finally, between a case that, that happened in the SDNY, where a federal judge really came down on the Bureau of Prisons, and two senators, Grassley and Durbin, saying to Colette Peters, the new head of the BOP, enough is enough. You have until December 7th to come back and answer our questions. And what she did yesterday, and it was an article and we posted a blog, she's now clarified that none of that applies. That if you are in prison and you qualify for earned time credits under the First Step Act, 
you are going to get them throughout your whole prison sentence. Yes, you might still only get 12 months towards a sentence reduction, but you'll continue to earn them regardless of where you are in your sentence. And if your sentence is less than 18 months, you're going to earn earn time credits for taking a productive, doing productive activities, taking approved courses and working in approved jobs. So a lot of the nonsense the BOP tried to get away with has been nipped in the bud. Now it's gonna be challenging because I really believe that, I use the analogy, it's like burning a candle at both ends. And as quickly, every day that you take a class or every two days you take class, one day comes off of your sentence, there's a lot of, of moving parts, but it will be captured when you do a computation report or when you see your case manager. So the good news is the law, as it was written in 2018, not interpreted by the BOP, but interpreted by Congress is finally being implemented. Again, I can't stress enough to anyone who has not yet surrendered, the first thing you need to do, and Scott can really touch on this because he did it, it didn't apply when I was there, is sit down in front of a computer. The first thing you need to do, get in front of a computer and fill out the needs-based survey. Um, I, I was told it takes 30 minutes, Scott clarified yesterday, it takes 10 minutes. That survey, when you fill it out, will start the, the clock rolling as far as getting credit for uh, classes and work. Don't give your case manager a reason to give you a problem. Even though ultimately you will win, don't give them a reason. So when you get in there, the first thing you need to do is fill it out. It also, which is something fascinating, that you will continue to earn these credits while you're in the halfway house or on home confinement. So as long as you're doing productive activities uh, on home confinement, maybe it's taking uh, parenting classes, or, or and these are all typically run or approved by the halfway house, you will continue to earn these credits. Now, again, they still max at 12 months, but everybody's sentence is different. And the good news is there's now been clarity on it. So- And Sam, does it also apply to supervised release as well? If you- no, no. once you're on supervised release, you're out of the Bureau of Prisons, your sentence is done. Uh, having said that, one of the important things to be aware of, and you know, we have clients and, and I'm a you know example of it. Um, you are, if you are a worthy candidate to go back to your judge, to request early termination of supervised release, you can do that. It's a different process. It, it doesn't have anything to do with the BOP. It's with your probation officer. But yes, that is something that absolutely can be done. And we can discuss that. So that, that's helpful. When we transition to probation on the fifth of our six subjects today, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to offer some advice for people that have interest at some point getting off probation early, together with some free resources that we're creating. And we'll put on the white call our advice site, excuse me, the prison professor site that will help you create a package uh, to try to get off probation early. But to try to get off probation early, and even though we're breaking up this webinar into six 10-minute subjects, you'll see or learn that all of them are really connected. So if the goal is reputation management or probation, all of that originates with what you begin to do right now. So whether you have already done the, the probation interview and it's completed, or you're getting ready to go to prison, the decisions you're making today will impact not just your sentence, but what happens while in custody. I mentioned Elizabeth Holmes. Part of the reason she got such a, a long sentence, not just the obvious of the loss amount, and she didn't accept responsibility, she didn't work since December of 2018. Why is that relevant? Pretty clear. Every day that she's not working as a law-abiding citizen, building a new record, paying taxes, proves the only way she was able only a, able to make money was by this Theranos fraud. Well, that relates to all of you. If you are waiting to get sentenced or even between sentencing and prison, it's essential that you're working. Now, someone reached out to me. They actually yelled at me after watching a YouTube video. They're like, oh, it's not so easy to get a job, man. I said, I understand it's hard with these departments one of justice press releases, but as you prepare for prison and as you try to articulate to a case manager why you're worthy of release, you're likelier to have success if you have support and if you have potentially a job, just show that you're looking for work. And of course, that person didn't want to do that because the truth came out. He had an MBA and working at a job that was beneath his skill set 
was something that he wasn't going to do. Aha, the truth comes out. That's something that Elizabeth Holmes would not do, a job that was beneath her skill set. So I'm begging all of you, whether you've been sentenced, you just sat for the PSR, you're negotiating a plea agreement, look for work because you're going to document that in your release plan as you prepare for prison. Work, 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 work. We've got to be able to show that we can earn money as a law-abiding citizen. Of course, if you're in prison, still do the job because a lot of people pay people to do their job. Continuing on, as you prepare for prison, point of contact, going to do rapid fire here. Point of contact, power of attorney. Expect potentially to get fired from your bank, Bank of America. The big banks are the worst. I'd encourage, I'm not a banker anymore but I can still talk like a UBS banker. I would encourage you to, even if you're married, to have separate bank accounts from your spouse. They'll fire the spouse who's done nothing wrong and not even on the bank account. And they'll say, have a nice day. We don't want your business anymore. And you're like, like I didn't do anything wrong. I'm, I'm a victim here as well. My husband did or my wife did. What are you talking about? They said, we know like you, get out. So I encourage you to manage all of this as you prepare for prison, different banking relationships, cultivating relationships, and of course, it's very concerning if you have a retirement account, and if you're younger than 59 and a half, and if you don't find a new place for your money, it will be a distribution and a big tax bill comes. Now, there's an accountant one time that said, oh, we could justify to the IRS why we're not going to pay the tax. It, a lot of luck with that. Okay, they want, their, they want their cash, and it's a mistake that people make. Power of attorney, plan, established new banking relationships, and budget. Uh, Jason, or uh, Scott, are you with us? Scott, how much did you send? Scott, by the way, is going to be new to our team as a volunteer. He was a former client who served time in prison. He attends all the webinars. He's awesome. He's going through the bureaucracy of the halfway house, getting him approved, which only takes, uh, we'll all be grandparents by the time it's officially done. Scott, how much money did you spend in prison every month? Did, did you form a budget before you went in? Um, I did not set up a, a buzz budget beforehand, but on average... I was probably on the low side, probably 300 or so a month. Okay. I didn't, so, I didn't, I didn't eat outside of the, the chow hall. I had a few snacks and things like that. Um, so, so that's good to say. Everyone's different. Some people spend a thousand, some people, people send a hundred dollars a month, but as you go in, absolutely prepare up your budget so your family can, can plan. And at the end of this, we're going to go through the sentencing calculator. So you can kind of extrapolate out how much money you need to save while you're away. If it's three years or four years, you get an idea of how long that will be. You can set that aside as you prepare to go. Do not send all of the money at once because if you owe restitution, they may take it. There's been more attention to restitution in part because recently R. Kelly, the former singer who was sentenced, some senators went apoplectic because they saw there was like $38,000 or something in his commissary account. And there's like, why is there money here? When he has victims and they took it. So there's going to be more attentions to victims and payments. And there are people in our community who have told us that if they have too much money coming in, someone recently got bumped from $25 a quarter to $180 a month. That's the consequence of owing money. And then the other consequence for some includes they begin to engage in the prison hustle to have money go into other people's books we're going to talk about that in, uh, in the next subject as we talk about prison. So as we wrap up preparing for prison, medications, updated doctor's letters, I'd certainly form a book list via Amazon that you can share with people. If you're fighting your legal case, you can surrender with legal papers. And I would absolutely, I say to the point where you may get sick of it, I'd be working on your release plan. Has anyone here taken the initiative to create their re release plan or, or been working on it? Jonathan? Things on. John's been working on it for a long time with our team. Anyone here have questions about the release plan? Do you know why that's you should be creating that before you go to prison? Anyone? Yes, Cheryl. Okay. Sorry. I don't know how to do the little hand thing. Yes. But um, so Adam is in a detention now. So when he goes to the BOP, sh he should be putting in what he's done so far in detent because he's actually done quite a bit that can look pretty nice on the um, release plan. It's not just for BOP. It's just in general since arrest. It's for the rest of his life. He's going to share this with everyone. First off, I think for the first step back, Sam, isn't it good news now if Adam's in administrative uh, holding, won't he now get some first step back credits while he's there? Only if he's doing productive, productive activities or classes. So. Oh my God, he's teaching the GED. He's going for his MBA, he's 
Uh, actually, no. Adam's not been sentenced. He's not in the BOP yet. Correct. That's what okay. But, okay. That, but eventually he'll get. At least he's getting credit for time served. So yes, yes. So my my. So that's even better. If he hasn't been sentenced yet, he's in a position to show to the judge what he's done while in confinement. Right. That that's that's a really great. So as he's preparing for prison or sentencing, if he's doing good things, it's a great mitigation strategy as well. Why? There are some people who sit around all day and do nothing while in custody. There are some people that call home and complain about the experience. They'll record those calls and sometimes use those recordings against the person at sentencing, especially if they're engaged in new criminal activities. You want to be careful with everything he's saying on the phone, of course. But if he's doing productive things, he's got to write about it. He should build that into his narrative or the mitigation strategy for the probation officer and the judge, and it will carry through post-sentencing. So it could be as easy as why he's teaching. Now, in my case, I would I taught a class, and for me, it was a win-win. Develop some com communication skills, but also it was a way for me to give back. I had had some opportunities in life many of my fellow prisoners didn't have. I wanted to educate them on experiences that I'd had. That's what I said about Elizabeth Holmes. She can complain all day and lament over the, the criminal justice system, or she can use the skill set she has to teach, much like Adam is doing. That's great. That shows change to a judge. That shows... Like I'm using my time productively. I'm not complaining. I'm trying to give back and contribute. That is awesome. But you know what? Sometimes they say the best marketer wins, including a marketer that may have the least amount of knowledge. If the judge don't know, then we got a problem. So that's what we want to build into the narrative and the reentry plan <clears throat> along the way. These are things that all of you do as you're preparing for prison. Because I know some of you are doing work that is beneath your skill set and it's difficult. Some of you are looking for work and you can't get it. It's worth showing the effort because too many of them presume we sit around all day, um, you know, doing doing nothing, talking about the life we used to live, and that's not healthy. So think about all of that as you prepare for prison. Lastly, drive slowly around that prison. I'd like to give a lot of tickets. I'd form your visitation list. I'd have a person, your contact list, because people are going to be hearing from you. And last but not least, as you prepare for prison, I really want you to manage expectations of your family, what you're going to do, how they're going to hold you accountable how frequently they may hear from you, and what that release date might actually be. And that's why I think the sentencing calculator is helpful. We're right on time at 8.50. Let's go to topic number three, prison. Prison, okay. All of you want to get out of prison early. Someone, Sam, Sam and I joked that someone watched our webinars and they said, hey, great stuff. I love it. Love the philosophical stuff and preparing and focusing on what I can and cannot control. But let me really tell you why I'm on the webinar. I just want to get out of prison early, man. <laughs> so it was really like an honest admission and I appreciated it. So Sam and I discussed with him uh, the way that you get, you try to get out of prison earlier is to avoid problemos on the inside. So let's talk for a moment about disciplinary infractions, maybe uh, Scott or, or Sam, because you both went through the, Scott Laney, because you, you guys both went through the drug program. But what is a disciplinary infraction and, and what is the consequence of a disciplinary infraction? So disciplinary infractions range from making a three-way call. Uh, you're you're uh, on the phone, you call your spouse, and you say, listen, can we get our child on the phone? This way I don't have to make uh, an extra call. That's considered a three-way call. That is, a believe it or not, a very serious infraction. Uh, right up to using a cell phone, drinking, drugs, using an iPad, everything you're going to see in a camp. And certain infractions carry different levels of uh, punishment, but no matter what, any infraction, whether it's as minor as uh, um, a three-way call or uh, getting into a fight or a cell phone, you will lose your ability to qualify for early release, uh, whether it's the CARES Act uh, or the First Step Act. You will be punished. Punishment might range from losing commissary and phone privileges for six months to in the case of a phone, losing the ability to stay in the camp. They will transfer you to a higher level security. Chances are you'll lose uh, phone privileges for a year, lose visits for a while. So everything you do or someone does while they're in prison, remember, you are being watched. You you're being watched by staff who love to catch you. You're being watched by other inmates that think it's a really good idea to turn you in and they might get credit for it. So keep in mind, you will get caught. You might not get caught physically with a phone uh, in your hand, but when they catch the phone, and they always catch the phone, they're going to look at your number, match it to your contact list. You get the same punishment as the guy with the phone. 
So, you know, look at our, our webinar on, on disciplinary infractions. I promise you, if you do something wrong, you will get caught. Maybe not the first time, but you only get one shot. And when you are caught, not if, when you're caught, you, depending, if you're on RDAP, you get thrown out of RDAP. You lose the ability to get an early release. You might get transferred to a higher level security facility, lose visits, lose phone calls. It's not worth it. It is not worth it knowing it. And also, it's very easy to get ostracized within the prison. So there was a, a prisoner who got a little too affectionate with his wife. And you're allowed to embrace at the beginning and end of a visit. And a guard thought he got a little too touchy. And the, the visit was shut down, not just for him, but for everyone. Imagine the effort and work that some families put in place to get there and the expense of getting a hotel room. Well, not only did that guy get into trouble, he is a pariah within the prison, loathed within the prison. So many people have said, Justin, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to use an iPhone. Okay, Justin, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to escape. I'm going to do my job. Some things may seem obvious, but it's the not so obvious that can get us into trouble. Like, what if your bunkie has an iPhone? Or what if you're associating with people that get into tr trouble? And many people get into prison because they turn the other way from wrongdoing. How do you respond to that? Our team wants to help you respond to that by adjusting properly in prison, forming a routine that you can defend. And I used to discuss this with Michael Santos in prison when I'd say, dude, how did you survive the penitentiary walking through puddles of blood? Like, how did you do that in that environment? And he said, well, I adjusted well. And the one thing I did is I created an environment where I was by myself as much as possible. And Michael spoke about having a job where he worked on the suicide wing in the penitentiary during the night, where he could read and write and do his studies. I think he, he was getting his undergraduate degree at the time. Then during the day, because he had done his job, he had more freedom and he avoided the, the TV room. He avoided the problems. I think for years he avoided the chow hall. So there are some things in prison you cannot avoid, like people creating and causing problems. But what you can do is kind of assess throughout my day, how much, how much am I controlling? And that can include spending a lot of time alone away from people that may not be advancing your own agenda. There were days in, in prison that like it would be two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. I hadn't said a word yet to anyone. And I kind of liked that as an introvert. And I'd spent a lot of time alone. And even some days I, with Michael, you know, we wouldn't work together and I was by myself. So I want you thinking about what you're going to do in prison all day which should include learning to say, no, I don't wanna walk the track with you. Sam and Scott feel differently about recreational activities in prison, which is fine. It's, every, it's your prison term. It's your prison term. I didn't wanna play softball for fear that I would get caught, uh, get hurt and I would never be the same. There was gambling there. I didn't wanna play softball because it was four nights of a, a, a game and three practices a week. I came home having to start over. That wasn't a good use of time for me. Everyone is different. Right, Scott or Sam would say, hey, I need a little break or a release. I've earned it. I agree. You've got to form your own routine, but make sure can you justify it to your friends and family? That includes the type of job that you line up. Is it a little or a lot? Uh, Scott, did you work in prison? What was your job? I was actually able to get into the one vocational program that Big Spring offered, and it was horticulture. Um, it was a good experience. We had class in the morning. You would come back at lunch. Then after lunch, you would go back to class and then you would come back to the dorm afterward. And you're, you're consistently earning certificates and time credits along the way. So I thought that was a better way to go. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of once you surrender, you immediately looking for jobs in and around the compound. Uh, a strategy that I used, I learned that there was a, a prisoner who assigned all of the jobs in the kitchen. And once I learned that I would be designated to the kitchen, I went to this prisoner and asked him if I could choose the jobs in the kitchen that are available. He said yes. So I could have been a baker, pots and pans in the morning or night, buffet line, which I didn't want to do. And because I was proactive and went to him, he said, you can do pots and pans in the morning if you in the afternoon, which enabled me to get my exercise done in the morning, because where I serve time, it could be like 110 degrees, 100 degrees, they would shut down the yard. So some days I'd have to go out 
as soon as the dorm opened. So now you should be thinking as you are, you know, when you're in prison, what type of job do you want? As I have said previously, the concern for some is you get what you want, a job that's an hour a day. And then what happens is you have the rest of the day where you kind of go stir crazy because you don't have enough things filling your attention and you're just bored. And then that's why some people will work for eight, nine or 10 hours a day. So you need to be thinking about jobs while you're in prison. Um, Sam, did you work while you were in RDAP? Uh, no. Uh, I Well, so at, they as soon as you get there, usually the first job they assign you to is the kitchen. That's pretty standard. Everybody gets assigned to the kitchen for 90 days. Because I had a soft shoe pass, so I wore sneakers instead of boots. Uh, the first day I walked into the kitchen wearing sneakers, they told me to wear boots. I said, I can't. They threw me out of the kitchen. I wanted to get a job. My counselor said, you have to find something to do. Because I'm an avid cyclist, they had three spin bikes out back. So I decided to approach on my third day, the head of education and say, look, I'm the only guy who rides. I was out at five in the morning. How about if I take care of the bikes? And he said, sure, that's your job. I got paid 14 cents a week, but that was my job. And at least I could say to my counselor, I found a job, I'm productive. It took me all of 20 minutes a day but I, I found a job. So it's important to find something. Um, but I had a lot of downtime. And in retrospect, I wish I would have found something that would have kept me more occupied. So is we're that that's okay. So we talk about jobs, little or a lot, be proactive and looking for work, being proactive in prison about the friendships that you form, the essential goal of avoiding disciplinary infractions, forming a book list before you go in, actually reading the books and the next subject will transition to to reputation management and why that we, our team thinks that's that's very helpful. But the concern in these prisons, either a media, a, a lower a campus, there's no violence. There'll be as much violence there as you may see it at your local donut, donut shop. It's boredom and strategies to avoid the inevitable boredom. Now, I was never bored. Thankfully, I had Michael guiding me. Without him, probably would have been bored. Okay, so we don't want you to be bored and calling home and complaining, it's so hard, it's so tough, I'm bored, I shouldn't be here. You're, you're going to hear people in prison call home saying that, and you're going to be thinking, I'm sure glad I don't do that, because prison's harder on those that love and support you. And let's not make it harder by telling them that life is miserable in a minimum security camp, when your spouse may be working uh, two jobs and managing everything without you. Make it about them, nurture that relationship, don't complain, which means you focus on what you can and cannot control. And you can't control perhaps your bunk or your job or how staff treat you, programs that may be available, but you can certainly control how you respond. And I know many people in our community are doing that. Scott did that. Sam did that. We want all of you to do that. And we want you, lastly, as we discuss prison, to, just, to really focus on nurturing relationships while in prison. And you can do that easier than ever because of core links. There was no email while I was in custody. I just did good old snail mail. You need to be nurturing relationships to the point where Michael measured how many letters he wrote every week. And then, you know, I'd say, dude, what if nobody responds? He's like, that's okay. I'll just continue writing hundreds of letters. But every now and again, he'd get a letter back, like from Joan Peter Celia, the penologist at Stanford, who said, Michael, would you write a chapter for my new book? Pretty cool, right? These things happen. Throw these lines out there. People are going to bite. But you should have a job lined up before you are released from prison without question. You should have written myriad letters to your probation officer while you are in prison. Keep copies of the letters that you write so you can share them in case they get lost. This is a good use of your time in prison, which kind of leads into subject four of reputation management. <clears throat> now, some people have said to me, hey, man, I don't need a website. I don't have interest in documenting my journey through federal prison on a website. That's cool. No one's trying to sell you a website or telling you to do a website. What I am telling you is if you need to make money again and you want to build relationships again and you want to work again, and more importantly, you want to try to show that you're different than the government's version of events, namely that uh, we're criminals who break the law, right? How many of us have had these sensationalized press releases? They're not great. So if those press releases have concerned you, and you're in a position where you need to work and make cash again, or in my case, all of the above, including telling someone, a nice woman out of prison, why I went to prison, what I learned from it, a lot of concerns here. One way you can do that is beginning to manage your reputation within the Bureau of Prisons. 
Scott, can you touch on one really kind of like supercharged way that you did it? And then we're going to go through like levels of ways to do it. Uh, but Scott, what is a strategy that you pursued while in custody? Sure. I created a website and it allowed me to document what I was doing with my time, what I thought of the experience, the books that I read, and really just overall kind of change the narrative surrounding, uh, you know, who I am and, and what I had done and how I'm growing from it. Great, great answer. I, I really appreciate you sharing that so succinctly. That was well said. I did the same thing while I was in custody. The site has morphed. But when I was in prison, I got scared. I used to say to Michael, I'm like, dude, this guy's only been in jail for 18 months and he just canceled a visit with his wife. Why? And I later learned the wife would say to him, so what do you do all day? Like, how are you going to support us when you come home? Like, what's the plan? You can't be a doctor anymore. Like, Ugh, he didn't want to go to visit. Literally turning down a visit in federal prison. Awful. So that's when I realized a lot of dudes were scared to go home. So in my case, I began documenting my journey through confinement, not with the idea to become a prison consultant or speaker. I just wanted to try to help for, I just wanted to try to help and provide some value for once. It had been a while. And this blog, ironically, by having intentions of doing the good thing, trying to help people, it launched what is now a, a business that's been around for more than 14 years. And as we speak about, about reputation management, there are people that reach out to our company today by way of Google who will literally come across a blog that was written in March of 2009, simply because Michael and I sat down and said, let's spend 15 minutes writing the blog. I'm going to send it home, put it on the website. Now you can do it through core links. You don't even need to do snail mail. But these blogs were very helpful while repairing my reputation because I was documenting what I was learning. When I leave prison, I know that I will have challenges. I have a negative net worth and a prison record. Yet the lessons I have learned give me confidence that was missing from my life before. The saying that what doesn't kill us makes him stronger holds true. I am stronger than ever, even if my rapidly approaching release date brings an eager anticipation that encroaches upon my sleep. I had insomnia before my release from prison. I was too obsessed about what life would be like afterwards. I want you thinking what you will do while you're in prison to repair your reputation. And if it's not a website or a blog that you can have made for about $12, if you choose on a site like Fiverr, I lived on Fiverr when I came home from prison. You can get stuff done for five, 10, 100, $200, super easy. You can go to MailChimp. We've had myriad clients and people in our community use MailChimp, it's free. What they'll do is this, they will send an email to their wife or spouse or son via core links. They'll just send the email home. From there, the wife or whomever is in their, their point of contact is kind of managing their list in mail and it's all free. And from there, the wife or whomever will mail out this their, their newsletter or what they were doing. How great is that? It's free. All it takes is the prisoner writing the document, okay? So MailChimp is a great resource to send writings on the inside out. Uh, core links, we have a number of people that every Monday they send an update of what they did the prior week. And of course, so I want you to look at MailChimp. I want you to look at Fiverr. By the way, another strategy that all of you, I want you to do, I want you to register your domain, your own name. There are some vicious, sickening people out there who will register your domain and they'll put your Department of Justice press release up there. That's happened about, I've gotten 10 of those calls over the last 12 years from a victim that buys the domain, registers the URL. And when you go to that person's name, it is their release. And this guy's a criminal and a thief and a crook. I hope he gets raped and killed in prison. It's terrible, terrible stuff. Victims are angry. They're mad. They want justice beyond a prison term. So go to godaddy.com and try to register your own name. It's a very good rep. You need to own your domain, your name. If it's taken because it's a common name, find something uh, close. But also a benefit is if you register the domain and you begin to do stuff like what happened with Scott Laney. You know, Scott had some press releases as a result of his case and whatnot. But just like that, because he's continually adding content, when you Google Scott Laney, boom, look what comes up. Look what comes up, his website. 
above the press releases because he's continually producing content. So I want you to also share this content with your probation officer, build it into your release plan if you don't want to go public as we did. Totally cool. But your reputation may not just be for a, a potential partner or employer. It's really for your probation officer because all of you want higher levels of liberty, which is how we transition to number five, probation. While in prison, write these letters to your probation officer. If you don't know who it is, fine. Pretty easy to find out the district that will supervise you. Just send them a letter. I'd write one every two or three months. You're also going to have your release plan that you'll eventually send and share. But you want to share what you're doing while in prison, what you're learning. And then you'll meet the probation officer most likely in the halfway house, right? Uh, Scott and Sam, when did you meet your probation officer? Well, I met, I, my probation, I met my probation officer probably about a month or so after I was in the halfway house. Okay. And Sam? You... 76, uh, 72 hours after I was released from home confinement. Remember, I didn't go to a halfway house. I went right from the camp. Uh, I was 14 months home confinement. Um, and then went uh, at the end of home confinement, they gave me a slip of paper and said, you have 72 hours to contact your probation officer. So I, James, I was going to make the outreach. Got it. Mr. Booth, it's very nice to, to see you. Welcome home. Have you met, have you met, if you want to unmute yourself, um, I'm wondering if you, I know you're home. Have you met your probation officer yet? Uh, yes. Uh, well, not, I'm not even sure probation officer. I assume that's after I'm out of home confinement, right? Right. So you're currently yeah. on home confinement, correct? I'm currently on home confinement, yes. And have they ex have they asked you to work? I know you're you're you may be retired. So what have they told oh. you about work? Well, oh no, I got I've uh, got some work, and uh, they do like you to get it. Uh, in my particular case, I took a paralegal course in prison uh, because uh, my violations would prevent me to do things in the field I was in before. Uh, and as it turned out, it was the best thing I could have done because. I landed a, a job with an attorney helping with estate planning uh, that fits in well with my background. So I am now working full time with an attorney uh, and the halfway house is very happy about that, <laughs> especially for an old guy like me. <laughs> How fantastic what, what he just said, productive in prison, used his skill set, recognized he couldn't do what he did previously, but the skill set didn't go away, obtained a new education certificates and he's got a full time job. Just like that, it's all stems from what he did. So thank you for sharing that and, and welcome home. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. And thank you for your help, okay? You're, you're welcome, of course. So as you prepare for probation, I know what all of you may want, higher levels of liberty. To get higher levels of liberty, it's helpful if you have a job lined up. It's helpful if when the probation officer says, I want you to pay X amount every month in restitution, uh, you pay it to the extent that you can. It's helpful if you can even send more money that's asked of you every month, the strategy that I put in place despite really needing the money, but it helped me get what I want, building my business and more liberty. When I would do speaking events, I would literally turn the whole honorarium over to, to restitution, and it was really hard because I needed it, but I knew it's, it was just an investment. I knew it would bear fruit down the road, and it always did, and I learned to live really lean, okay? They, they're going to monitor your expenses. They will give you trouble at times if you're spending too much. That happened to me a few times. But as you prepare for probation, write the probation officer, have work lined up. Sam, when you start probation, you're going to be required to fill out some forms, correct? What is it, like some psychological forms and things like that? You're going to have to fill out a bunch of financial forms, uh, whether you have restitution or not. And then there's a psychological profile form. You actually fill those out every year. So if you had three years of probation, you'll fill it out three times. And it's, um, if any of you have been to a psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, back in grade school, I think, or in school used to take them, they would ask you the same question five different ways. Uh, a lot of it has to do with your propensity to recommit a crime or how you deal with stress or drug abuse or uh, liquor, situational questions. So they ask you, literally, you're, you're, if you find yourself under pressure financially, uh, will you rob a bank? They're going to ask you that question five different ways, and they want to see what your like, what your risk factors are. So, uh, you know, understand. It's a standard. What I filled out in July of this year, I filled out again in July of this year. Standard thing, but the expect to answer it, at least on the financial one, answer it honestly. Do not exaggerate. Do not embellish. Do not guess. If you don't know the answer. Say you'll get back to them. 
That's right. They're also looking for consistency. Chris Maloney, the former head of federal probation, told our team that the first thing a probation officer will do is read the probation report. And that could include, um, they're really, they may look at the financials as well. There are people that have violated their probation by selling assets that weren't previously disclosed in the probation report. In many cases on probation, you'll actually need permission to sell an asset, even if it's been disclosed in the probation report. Unfortunately, someone in our community went back to Atwater for 75 days, and I believe they extended his term of supervised release because he sold some cryptocurrency without approval from his probation officer. And the rationale is, my restitution's paid in full. Why can't I live my life? Well, a probation violation may not be the breaking of a law, but when you're under the grips of, of the government, a violation can send you back to prison. While on probation, you'll need permission to travel, most likely outside of your district. It should be business related. You, violations occur every day, including leaving the district without permission. Many do. Uh, there was a very unfortunate situation where a probation officer one week before someone completed their three years of supervised release, the probation officer audited the person's books the bank statements, which you give them permission to access and get. And the probation officer learned that this person had uh, gone to a coffee bean in San Diego and paid on a credit card or debit card. And this person didn't have permission to leave the central district that I'm in actually. Like I'm in Orange County, you, can't, you can go to LA, Riverside. At some point you need permission to leave this district. And this person went to San Diego. And um, just like that, you finish three years of supervised release, it starts all over. Why? because he went to San Diego without permission. And what happens sometimes on probation is it's kind of like what happens in prison. You, you're really cautious when you get that to prison and then eventually you're like, hey, I understand this environment, it's good, I can manipulate it. And you let your guard down. That happens a lot on probation. Even I made a mistake on probation. I gifted an LLC to a friend and I was the signer and my probation officer called freaked out. Why are you on this LLC? I'm like, oh, I was just doing it as a gift for someone, I'm sorry. And I'm in the business. Some mistakes happen. But it's essential that you keep clear uh, records. Of course, if you come into a tax return, lottery winnings, inheritance, if you owe money, you've got to disclose it. I do really encourage good bookkeeping. If people are going to send you money in prison, document it. Why? Well, when you're successful on the other side and making money and you choose to pay that person back, your probation officer may flip out. They say, why did you just send uh, $12,000 to Joe Smith? Well, I don't, he lent me money while I was in prison. I borrowed money from him. I don't see any record of it. What are you talking about? You're hiding money, right? Document it. Keep very clear records. You're going to fill out financial forms every single month. They're looking for consistency. Also, when they visit your home, they're going to look to see if you have a new TV, you have a new piece of art or a rug. If they consider it a value, you want to disclose those things. They're cynical. Now, probation's not to be it's not supposed to be punitive it's supposed to be rehabilitative but uh, the reality is they could be looking to violate you if you're in trouble and these are things we want all of you to understand and embrace are there any questions about probation as i as i continue yes share talk to me goose okay so the probation report you're talking about is the initial psr that no. happens is that what no. where you're disclosing every all your information to, to sam can touch on this also there's Throughout the whole journey, he'll be sharing information many times, including the probation report that that he'll do with an interview, that he'll do the interview with his lawyer next to him. A probation officer will interview him. That interview will lead to a completed probation report. Correct. That will, right, that report so will So in go other words, if something's on there now, yep. and between now, he's not, we don't have sentencing yet, but there's an asset on there that is going to be um, sold. I should have that reported and change like do you just wait or i don't know do you, well, well, what do you do? we can send i'll tell you have you seen the probation report uh, no i'm waiting so here, it. here's a here's a good exercise for you to learn to the extent that the government wants information we can send you a draft of the a probation report the questions they'll ask him because they're very similar to what they'll ask about probation we had that we did the interview but okay. we just don't have the report Right. So, right. Okay. That's fine. But what you'll see is they ask, are there any transfers of over $500? Do you owe money? Is there interest on the money? I mean, there are some people that are so concerned about government investigations. We have someone in our community, the mom, 
sends money to the son in prison. They paid for the legal fees, paying for the restitution. They literally have a note notarized that says, this is how much we have lent our son. This is the interest because someday mom and dad want to get paid back. And the, but it's all documented. It's very clear. And it's like, hey, the interest is accruing every month, even if the interest is nothing or 1%, something like that. But just very clear records are helpful because if you come when you come home and you send out a payment, they want to say, well, I owe I owed this money. Now, they may still give you a tough time because of it because they want all of it for restitution. But it's just a good idea to be very clear with the records. And also, there are some people who get fired from a bank who have to move the money to their spouse's account because you know they're like, no bank will touch me. Document that, or else what could a cynical probation officer say? Why did you move $73,000 to your wife to avoid paying restitution? No, no bank will, you know, no bank wants to do business with me. I had no choice. Just document to be clear, and you can even build that into your release plan. I just find it there's if Michael Santos did one thing incredibly well, it was documenting everything that he did to the point where I would say, dude, are you serious? And now years later, it benefits him when he's making presentations because he can show someone he show someone what he did August 4th, 1993, while he was in prison. It's in, it sounds crazy, but that documentation is crucial. You need that. If not, they may not believe you. It's the same reason some people at a sentencing hearing don't get the outcome they want because everyone else is doing the work or they say it and they haven't shown it. That kind of happened with Elizabeth Holmes yesterday too, talking about charity work she's going to do. And it's like, why haven't you done it? You've been home for four years. You didn't do it then. Suddenly you're going to do it. Nah, you just want probation, right? Come on. If you really were going to do it, you'd have done it. You've got to put yourself in the shoes of the stakeholders. So Cheryl, document every penny, be very clear about it. And they are going to look for a consistency down the road. Okay. Any other questions with uh, with probation? I see any hands here. Yes, no, maybe. Larry, I see you're with us. Larry might have gone bye-bye here. Larry's on our team. I was going to ask him a question, but I'm not sure he's still here. Someone asked if we can send um, a copy of the probation report. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Uh, Hale asked, can you teach classes on your topics of expertise? That's a good idea. Something good to do while in prison. It could be approved as your job. Uh, maybe not. Still, you want to volunteer potentially and try to teach it. It's great for, to help people. It's great to help you. It's great to build into your reentry plan. And it's just it's just a really great thing to do to share experiences with other people. So when I try to teach a class in prison, my case manager said, put up a line in education and see if anybody signs up. I was like, OK. And I taught a class on the Dow 30. And, you know, there's many people in prison who don't know what a Dow stock is or what a dividend stock is. And it was super fun to teach them. And I remember at the end of the class, one guy's like, so my baby's two. If I set aside $25 a month, she'll have this amount by she's 18. If it grows at this rate, had no idea that the power of compounding and, you know, you should go to Disney, you go to McDonald's, eat that you can own the company. It was super cool. So yes, use your experiences to teach whether it's your job or, or not. Someone asked about list of do's and don'ts in the halfway house. Certainly that's part of the probation process. Can anyone jump in there and offer some uh, things that I can immediately say? Much like prison, don't complain. Don't run to staff unnecessarily. Um, recognize that, that um, they, I think they're pettier in the halfway house than they may be in prison, right? And like higher security prisons, they have more things to worry about. But the lower down you go, things that might feel like insignificant to you can be a big deal to them. So does anyone have some do's and don'ts for life in the halfway house? I would say that when you get there, read the entire rule book. It's really tempting to go, oh my gosh, I just got out of prison today. This is amazing. Um, they're going to give you a packet that's entirely too thick with a lot of crazy rules and make sure you know them and ask for clarification. Me, for example, I made a mistake in the halfway house. I used a credit card. I didn't know we were, we were only supposed to use debit cards and it caused a big headache for me. It seemed like it was something really small. So saying I didn't know, or I was unaware is, is not an excuse. And like Justin said, it, it, it is exceptionally petty there. But that's not our job to complain about. Our job is just to read the rules, stay humble, and and follow them. That's right, uh, Scott. If you see anyone else, how, go ahead, Scott. I'm actually on home confinement, but I report to a halfway house, so it's very similar conditions. I would just say when you're at the halfway house or on home, home confinement, expect a much higher degree of micromanagement 
even than when you were in prison. Yeah. I, have, I have to call the halfway house and let them know when I leave, when I arrive at my pre-agreed destination, when I leave that destination, and when I get home. And it, it seems crazy, it seems like a waste of time, but you just have to adapt to their rules, which are very, very micromanaging. That, that's actually a very good point. Thank you, Scott, for sharing that. When I was in the halfway house and my job was approved, they called, the halfway house would call my employer many times a day. And I worked in a real estate office and my broker was a great guy, but like he'd be out doing deals and whatnot. And they told me if your broker or boss doesn't call back more quickly, we're going to take away your job. And I was like, wow. So they'll also, that was, you know, that was frustrating because he was doing me a favor. And I told him like, dude, I'm sorry, you got to call him back. They'll also walk around and pop through. And you have to learn not to get frustrated. I recall it was um, July 4th, actually. I had my first pass on a holiday. And literally, as I was pulling into my mom's home for July 4th, they called and said, come back to the halfway house right now. Why? Well, we want to do it. We want to do a random drug test. I don't even know if they told me that actually, that it's just come back within the hour. And they can do that to be a little bit petty just to get at you. And I drove all the way back and I did a drug test that, of course, I passed. And I made it to July 4th, a couple of hours late. A big deal. Eventually, this will end. But they do that in part to test you. Okay. And because they can. But you do have to check in repeatedly. So do's and don'ts, uh, we'll cover them more. Thank you for the question. We're going to cover more of that next week. We're going to go through this again, do's and don'ts in the halfway house at greater length. I really like that question, Timothy. Thank you so much. We'll cover it more next week. Last but not least, let's go through the sentencing calculator. Sam, could you put up a link, put the link there? Would anyone like to go through their potential sentence and we can give an idea of what that sentence would look like based on the First Step Act? Would anyone I would. Like I would. <laughs> Who do we have here? Who said that? Is that Jason? Who is that? Yep, that's Jason. Okay, good. Let's do it. <laughs> Justin, we did Jason's yesterday, so you can pull that up from what we did. Uh, let's do. Okay, well, let's do. Uh, oh, we did. You're right. We did. One moment. Well, let's just do it again for everyone to watch. Yeah. You ready? But your your email, Justin, so you get it. Okay, the sentence, Sam, tell me how to do this. Uh, J J um, Jason, 57 months? Yes, sir. 57. Uh, your start date is when? December 15th. Okay. Uh, put the number one in there because he only had one day prior credit. Are that participation? Yes. So let me explain something about Jason. When we first met Jason, actually, Jason, why don't you tell him why we can now put yes in there? Uh, because Sam saved my life. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, like many of you, you know, I hired a really expensive attorney and um, I was going through just meeting, you know, um, these guys just eight, nine, a year too late, but it's never too late when you can catch up and get something done. So I was um, uh, uh, sentenced to, gosh, 57 months. I was already in a, you know, I entered into a um, alcohol and uh, drug program with my health care provider, which is Kaiser Permanente. Um, Sam orchestrated the impossible, which was convincing my attorney to go to the judge to reopen the PSR, which never happens never happens to get it amended so it can show that uh, I was in a program and I, I should be in a program when I go in. And after much wrestling with our own attorney who I was paying, uh, Sam and, and uh, Larry actually wrote the order for the attorney so that we sent it to him and he didn't want to do it. And uh, quite frankly, Sam gave me the courage to punch my own attorney in the mouth and make him do it. Uh, and he sent it in and voila, uh, my, my PSR gets amended so that it shows that, uh, I'm, I'm in a program and I should, uh, uh, qualify for RDAP. And then on top of that, uh, I'm, um, Sam and those guys got me moved from 
uh, a prison that was seven and a half hours away that didn't have RDAP to two and a half hours away from my home that does have RDAP. And so um, I got a real shot now at, at uh, getting better and um, uh, reducing my time dramatically. So let's go through this. Uh, Justin and FTC with low, put the number six. The reason we put six in here is because typically the first six months that you, you show up, uh, you have to wait until the first or second team meeting you have uh, to go from low to medium. So when you enter the facility, you're typically always low, even though you should be minimum. Uh, and then they'll, they'll modify it to minimum. So six here. Uh, Justin, for the other FTC, put 24 uh, months. There's a reason we put 24, and I'll explain why. So hit submit. And we're uh, going to put up, we'll, we'll put up a link to the calculator. I did. Chat. Okay, good. Thank you. Everyone okay. should should use it. And that come, comes back to the point number two of preparing for prison and managing expectations for your, your family and um, plugging in what it will look like. And you see where the real value of good time, RDAP, First Step Act, Second Chance Act. Justin, um, you should have gotten the, the projection. All right, one moment. Okay, one second. I don't have it yet. It's coming. One second. So as that's as that's coming up, one second. One second. I can actually pull up the one from yesterday as well. One second. Hey, uh, 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 Justin, I want to tell you other participants something, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Don't be afraid to make your lawyer do their damn job. Don't be afraid because they don't, they, they, they either don't care or they don't know how. And uh, Sam uh, you guys gave me the uh, courage to, uh, I mean, Sam just finally said to me, man, you're paying him. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so that, that's what I, that's what I want to tell people, you know, these, these guys, once they, once your sentencing is over, you don't hear from them again, unless you get on top of them. Well, I, th that's a really valid point, and we're going to touch on that next week as well, holding the lawyers accountable and, and really how to go about doing that. And to, to Jason's credit, I remember we did a, a video call while I was in Chicago, and you had expressed frustration over the lawyers and the idea. And then we just sort of had this conversation where it was like, um, it may be painful to push them, but what happens if you don't is you may have a, a whole lot of regret moving forward. And, you know, he did it. And I was very surprised that it happened, but that's the beautiful thing. You try. The worst thing that can happen is the judge says it ain't going to happen. We have someone in our community that that wanted a two week extension. Jonathan, maybe you can touch on that. It's okay. He asked for a two week extension. The judge, the judge said no. That's the way it goes. Um, Correct. That did just happen. <laughs> right. So sometimes we're, you know, and, and had someone said to me, "Where would you be more successful? Amending the PSR, getting the two week extension." 99% of the time, I just said the judge will grant the extension, not amend the PSR. These things happen, but we're teaching you to advocate how to, how to try. Uh, you know, a, a few days ago, I got this call from someone. It's actually a very good lawyer. It's a really good lawyer, but the lawyer didn't allow the narrative and the lawyer didn't want the narrative in the probation report. And the lawyer even acknowledged, yes, the probation officer will recommend how long you're going to serve in prison. And the defendant's like, well, why then would I not use this narrative to influence the probation officer? And the lawyer's like, I've never done it before. I'm not going to start. And it's like, damn, I hired the wrong lawyer. He's not letting me advocate and mitigate. We try, we push, and we advance our agenda because at some point we think it's going to benefit you. We, we really we really do. Uh, Jonathan, your hand is up. What's your question? Yeah, um, I have a couple questions based on the, the updated First Step Act that came out yesterday. Um, and you might know the answers to this, you might not. Uh, it mentioned the needs assessment analysis seems pretty self-explanatory, get in front of a computer uh, and do that. But in this, it says portions of the SPARC 13 assessment require the inmates active participation. What, what is a SPARC 13 assessment? Uh, hold on. Let me go through this. Uh, you ready, Justin? Yeah, let me, Jonathan, we'll come back to that question. Let me wrap up the calculator here, okay? Just scroll all the way down. Okay, go ahead. To summation. Go all the way down to summation. 
Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. So keep in mind, Jason's original sentence was 57 months. For the purpose of this, we're looking at numbers uh, five, six, and seven, specifically seven. Under a 57 month sentence where Jason qualifies for RDAP, take, completes RDAP and takes uh, the uh, appropriate number of, of courses um, while he's there. In other words, takes the classes and works while he's there. He's eligible to come home in 19.6 months. I wanna be very specific. On a 57 month sentence, it says 19.6. I had 60 months before the first step back. I was home in 21. So it's, it's, a, it's a very accurate number. So Jason, we always tell people the first uh, uh, hurdle is getting the best outcome at sentencing. The second is once you know the number, how can we help you to advocate and understand how to get spend the least amount of time in prison? In Jason's example, he'll spend roughly 19.6 months uh, before he's eligible to transition to halfway house home confinement. 57 months because he advocated the way he did with his attorney and reopened this pre-sentence report, qualify for RDAP under 20 months. Perfect. That, that's that's the that's that's what we want to do. And um, of course, it all comes down, all these things are connected. It comes down to making sure that he's avoiding problems, Jason's avoiding problems in prison and all that, all that stuff. Um, Sam, did you want to come back to Jonathan's questions about the first step back? So, okay, the spark, it, it, and again, the genesis is you need to fill out the need survey test. Once you fill out that, that assessment, that's the uh, catalyst to enable you to start accruing uh, the points. The, uh, the, the spark itself, as far as you're concerned, will have, it's just a, a, a term, but you need to, fill, you will not be, um, impacted as long as you fill out the needs assessment test, you're going to be taking RDAP anyway, and start taking the approved classes as soon as possible. You will accrue all the necessary time. And Jonathan, what's interesting is the last time you and I spoke, we stopped crediting time at 18. And now with this, uh, uh, I guess, confirmation of the law, that's going to really inure to your benefit. Sure, I appreciate that. What if you do this needs analysis and there's just no, and again, I don't know what's going on in the Miami camp. What if there's like literally no programming except the RDAP class? Well, there there's are, nothing else. Is there are, there is. I spoke okay. to a client of ours uh, who is there. I spoke to his, uh, him uh, earlier in the week and they are back to full programming. Okay, last question. And I appreciate your time, everybody. Um, my understanding is before these changes yesterday that low, uh, got 10 days per every 30 and to get the additional five days you had to be minimum but on page 10 letter c number two letter i it says inmate will earn an additional five days of fsa time credits if the inmate is determined to be minimum or low so does that mean now the low also gets that extra five days so no, you're going to get to minimum very, very quickly. Now I know at Miami, you'll typically meet with the case manager within a week and then the second time within 90 days. So at, and I can only speak for Miami when I was there, you will get to my, you will get to minimum very, very quickly, if not right sure. away. Certain camps, they do it a little differently. Um, I heard yesterday at a camp up in New Hampshire, it was taking a little longer, but Miami specifically, you will get to minimum very quickly. Thank you. Okay, thank like thank you for your time. Like thank you. Jason, I see your hand up. Yeah, Sam, I wanted to ask you, and uh, for you guys that don't know, I'm the Black Justin Perperny. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sam, how did, you, how did you get to go straight home um, instead of the halfway house? Who determines that? So my case manager and I had, I didn't know about Michael and Justin until I read Michael's book when I was about oh, six months from release. I didn't even know consultants. I heard about them. I heard about people getting great results, obviously, after spending half a million dollars on my attorney and getting a horrible result. I learned the hard way. But I, I read Michael's book when I was there and I, I realized that I needed to be a really good advocate. So 
I put together a plan and I really worked with my case manager. She had no desire to work with me and my counselor. Plus, I, I in a very unusual circumstance, befriended the warden because we're both cyclists. And he had a problem with his bike one day and he asked me if I could come over to the low and fix it for him. So I did. And I got to tell you, the other inmates did not appreciate that. They thought I was going behind their backs and ratting until they realized that wasn't happening. So you have to be very careful with that. And um, I convinced them that I did not need transitional housing. Also, in fairness, it was COVID. And a lot of halfway houses were concerned about inmate populations. So at my age, I was over 55. I had a place to go back to. I wasn't there that long. I didn't need transitional housing. It was easier to propose going directly home. Now we have clients that go directly home. Um, we had a client that um, uh, had a 14 month sentence. Yesterday, Justin, he sent us an email. Bob um, went to Otisville. He surrendered in June. He was released yesterday. We got helped him get out in the CARES Act, 25%. Went right home, no home, no halfway house. So it's, it's about your release plan. It's about the halfway house. Are they full? If they're not full, they might want to get you there because it's a bed you're paying for. But as part of an effective post-sentencing plan, expect to go to a halfway house. But once you're there, we will help you again through the release plan. Advocacy, get to home confinement as quickly as possible. Well said. Thank you. Are there any other questions um, that we haven't? Yeah, um, I have uh, one. Sam, somebody so, just texted me. So uh, someone asked. Someone asked why you inputted twenty four on the first step back minimum pattern score. Uh, yeah, because twenty four is the most amount of time to get one year off your sentence. So on a sentence, I, I knew the answer to this going into it. On a sentence of sixty or less where the person's taking RDAP, 24 is the only viable number to put in there. It, it, it has no bearing on the amount of earned time credits that are applied towards his release. He will have maxed out uh, already. So I know that if your sentence is 60 or less and uh, actually 40 to 60, you put 24 into the calculator. If you, people have questions about individual issues regarding the calculator, get in touch with me and I can go through it with you. Every situation is different. And I just happen to have known in Jason's situation, the number would be 24. And that is the only number to put in there. Thank you, Tasha. Welcome. I see your hand up. Hey, thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Um, and if you want to answer this at the end, that's perfectly okay. We're, as we're, far at, as we're, we're at the end. This is the time. Okay, awesome. okay, okay. I didn't want to mess up, mess up your agenda. Um, I, one of the first calls I was on, you guys mentioned that there's absolutely no working while you're in prison. And um, I'm a very experienced financial analyst and have been really worried about my son in this transition. So I taught him some minor like accounting bookkeeping skills. And he's also worked for me for a while so that he could um, help himself while I'm away. And but he's obviously not as experienced as I am. So is it absolutely out of the question that he asks me things that he may not understand while I'm in prison? Am I not allowed to answer those types of questions? I'm not making any income from it. Yeah. I helped him start on LLC. So <laughs> you're you're teaching, you're advising. It's not like he's actively involved in running the business. Um, is it correct? No, he is the business owner. Um, so, I taught him and helped him form his own business. So you want to be, so look, so, so running, if, if running a business in prison is technically a, a disciplinary infraction, mm -hmm. there, there are ways to go about contributing or running a business. It kind of comes back to reputation management and even being very transparent. So like we ran a business like by way of the blog, I, I kid you not because there's a Bureau of Prisons policy that allows the writing of manuscripts or writing online. So if you were to go to like Scott's blogs or my blogs, the whole business plan, the whole business is built for the whole world to see. So that's a very transparent strategy to, to write about what he's doing, to write about the business. <clears throat> if he doesn't want to do that, 
what are other options? Well, when you visit together, of course, there's really no risk because you're together for eight hours a day. You can discuss the business all day. The, the second best way would probably be good old snail mail. Can they read the letter? Yes. Will they? Probably not, but they can. So if you're going to write about business type stuff, it's best to do it through a letter after visitation. Third is email. Um, if you have to and break up the email thread so you're just not responding back and forth all day with business, flat, the least desirable way is over the phone because it's, it's very easy to interpret. Uh, typically, when running a business, I'd say, I, I'm in prison. I can't help you. I, this is my advice. Do what you like. So you want to get these prefaces out there. But you don't want to say, are we making money? What are we doing? How's the business doing? I mean, that's obvious, right? So these are just yeah. preparations that you should put in place. But to the extent that you can keep it off the phone, you probably should. Okay. So just to clarify, he owns the business. I'm the person that's surrendering. Yes. And so... I Okay, then, okay. I then, just then, want to make then, sure. Then, then flip, flip everything that I just said. So when you're okay. calling him, try to discuss it in visitation. Be very good old Sam, okay. things of that nature. Just flip around everything that I said. So just don't have him ask me. Like if he's like, how do I record this type of transaction? Like just tell him not to ask. I, me you, did, you know, th this requires a, a, a lengthier conversation to be clear. But you say, okay. look, look, I'm in prison. I love you. I don't know. I can't offer you any advice. I'm in prison. Consider doing this. My advice is to, to do this, but it's your decision. I'm in prison. You're at home. Okay. This is my suggestion. You kind of want to get these, pref you want to preface it by that way, right? Okay. Kind of okay. like kind of like that rather than- Lead into uh, it. How's business doing? Did this do pay us? Let's take into collections. What, you know, that's how some people talk in prison because you're just- Oh saying, yeah, no, no. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You just- you want to be very, um, you just want to be very deliberate. And also it's good to break okay. up some of the, the email chains. And it also, last I'll say on this, we can touch on this next week as well. Maybe I'll dedicate 10, 15 minutes to running a business in prison or how to in a way that uh, avoids problems. You you want to, um, what's the best way to say it? What's the best way to say it? You want to show discipline. If you get a letter on a Tuesday from your son that frustrates you and you feel like you immediately if you get a letter on a Tuesday to respond, everyone, I want you to exercise some discipline and think, okay, I got this letter on a Tuesday. I'm visiting with him on Saturday. It can wait. I don't need to respond to this via phone. I don't need to send an email. I'm going to see him in three days and we can discuss it. So it just requires some discipline discipline on your part to okay. think that that is a piece of advice that that I would offer to you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Did, did we address all of them? All good? Okay, guys, I will. I'm going to end this recording. I'll uh, we'll send the recording to all of you next week. As I mentioned, um, Really grateful that you're here. Not sure what we're going to cover next week, but I promise you it will be of value. And we'll actually give thought to what we're going to do next week because it's Thanksgiving. And I know many of you will be off. So let me coordinate that with my team. Until then, have a wonderful rest of your weekend. I'm going to gymnastics with the kids. And I'll, I'll see all of you next week, okay? Thank you.